Good evening, I'm Mike Knetter and welcome to our UW Now live stream series where we bring you experts from the UW community talking about various aspects of the pandemic. Last week, we focused on the implications of the pandemic for the university. We had the unofficial Big Ten Chancellor of the Year, Rebecca Blank, talking about how she and her team are managing UW operations during the crisis. And we had Big Ten Men's Basketball Coach of the Year, Greg Gard, telling us about their pandemic shortened season, uh, all its ups and downs, and of course, their run to the virtual NC2A championship. This week, we're gonna shift back to talking about the virus itself, and we're pleased to have one of UW's leading experts on viruses. Thomas Friedrich is a double badger and a third generation badger. He's a professor of pathobiological sciences in the School of Veterinary Medicine, and he's gonna talk about the evolution of the virus and what we've learned about its spread in the state of Wisconsin. His lab is a great example of the value of interdisciplinary research that can be done on a campus of our size and scope. I'm gonna to let Tom kick things off by telling us a bit about the work being done in his lab. I'll ask him a couple of questions in response to his remarks, and then we'll go to audience questions from the live chat feature in YouTube. So put your thinking caps on, come up with some good questions for Professor Friedrich. And uh, Tom, it is just great to see you. Uh, I hope to be with you again soon, one of these days. Um, you've been a regular speaker for us over the years and always done a fantastic job. And I appreciate you taking a little time to share your insights with our audience tonight. Tom? Thanks, Mike. It's a real pleasure to, to be with you, if only virtually. And I hope we can, we can all get together in person sometime soon. Um, so as, as Mike said, I'd like to start off by just telling uh, everybody a little bit about what my lab, uh, together with many others, has been doing um, to respond to COVID-19, and then I'd certainly be happy to, to um, answer questions. So I first wanna talk about um, a group of scientists that we call the Coven, or the Coven. Um, we, uh, we debate how we should pronounce that. So uh, big C, little o, big V is the scientific abbreviation for coronavirus. Um, and we put together a, a group of scientists to um, to do what we call an open science response to the pandemic. So that is, we want to find ways that scientists across institutions and um, across the world can collaborate to find the the best uh, the best vaccines, the best treatments, the best approaches, rather than competing with each other, um, as has unfortunately often been the the model in the past. So, can I have the next slide, please? So in my own lab, our research focuses on how viruses like influenza and Zika, and now the novel coronavirus, which we call SARS coronavirus 2, emerge from wherever they are before they infect humans, um, how they get transmitted from one host to another, and how they cause disease. We know that they have to overcome a lot of evolutionary barriers in order to do this. And we want to understand that process because there are many animal viruses that infect humans, but a relative minority of them um, successfully go on to cause pandemics. So we hope to understand the process by which the successful ones do this so we can make them less successful in the future. Next slide, please. So just a few things about the coronavirus itself. You can see here on the left two images of this novel virus. The first is a false colored electron micrograph. So this is actually a picture of the virus itself with the coronavirus, the uh, spikes that are colored in red um, that give the virus its name. They sort of reminded somebody of the, the rays coming out of the corona of the sun when they first saw this in an electron microscope. Um, and then on the bottom, there is an artist's rendering of what it might look like if we could take a slice through this virus and look on the inside. So this virus is, um, is a little bit of a membrane that encloses a protein that's wrapped around uh, an RNA genome. So ribonucleic acid instead of deoxyribonucleic acid forms the, the genes of this virus. And the job of that virus particle you see is just to carry those genes to new cells to infect them. So 
Um, this virus emerged in humans in China uh, late last year. Like any other virus, um, it's barely even really alive. So um, the job of this virus particle, as I said, is to um, find appropriate cells and hijack those cells and force them to make more viruses. And the cells that this virus is good at infecting happen to be in the human airway, and that's why it causes the disease it does. Um, we hope that there will be vaccines available um, to make us immune to this virus at some point. Um, there are currently over 80 vaccines in preclinical development, according to the World Health Organization, um, but they are probably many months, if not a year or even more, away from um, receiving regulatory approval, meaning that they'd be available uh, to give to, to most people um, uh, through their doctors. So in the interim, we're hoping there might be some treatments. There is an expert panel that was just convened by the US National Institutes of Health um, that said late last week that they find no good treatment options yet. So, so far, we don't have solid data saying that any of the candidate treatments that you may have heard about is truly effective. We know that there are still infections happening in Wisconsin, throughout the state. Um, there's a particularly alarming increase in uh, newly reported infections in Brown County, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Um, so we are still very much in the midst of this pandemic, both globally and locally. And without good treatments or vaccines, that means that the social distancing practices that you've all heard about and uh, maybe starting to get tired of um, remain our most important measure of control. So the sort of curve flattening that you've heard about is, is working, but we need to keep it up. Next slide, please. So in my lab, together with many uh, other labs, both here at UW and around the world, some questions that that we're addressing with our research um, are how does the coronavirus cause disease? So by what process does it, um, does it cause disease? Why is it the disease worse in some individuals and not so bad in others? Um, what countermeasures, so what treatments or vaccines will work against this virus? Um, in Wisconsin, how did the virus get to Wisconsin in the first place? How many times was it brought here? How is it being transmitted? Is it moving around a lot in Wisconsin? Which is something I'll talk about a little bit more in just a couple minutes. We wanna know if we can find ways to make cheaper, easier, faster tests more widely available. Um, and in all of this, we're trying to model um, open science. So what we want to do is, is foster uh, collaboration and cooperation and openness among scientists so that we advance the field faster um, and not competition. So um, we can get a lot more done if we don't worry so much about maximizing each individual um, scientists or each individual institution's credit, um, but just do our best to, to have everyone collectively do the best science. Next slide, please. So this shows where the um, 142, actually 143 as of today, um, scientist members of the COVID collaboratory um, reside. So this map shows locations of laboratories. Uh, there are over 30 different institutions in uh, the United States, in South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia um, that join us for weekly conference calls where we plan what's, uh, what experiments we're going to do um, interpret data from experiments we've already done um, and try to divide the work so that we are not um, being redundant, we're not competing with each other, um, but rather we're cooperating together, as I said, to um, try to make discoveries and accelerate them um, for everyone and, uh, and not compete with each other. Next slide, please. So part of our effort is, um, is a commitment to making the data from our own experiments available online in as close to real time as we can do it. Uh, this is something that, that we started to develop, um, my friend and colleague Dave O'Connor and I, um, in our work on the Zika virus a few years ago. Um, back then we felt a little bit out on a limb because it was very much not how most scientists operated. Um, but I'm pleased to see that there's much more sharing nowadays and as I think most people in the science and public health fields uh, recognize that 
and we need to band together. And it's really all of us in humanity against the virus. So we need to, to pool our resources. So what you can see here is the three main research initiatives in, in our labs um, and links to our research protocols, um, the way that we analyze our data, um, the data itself and some interpretation that is posted as, as quickly as we can get it up on the web. You can actually see a link at the bottom of, uh, of this uh, slide here. So together we're working on preclinical uh, models to understand the uh, mechanisms of disease and to test vaccines and therapeutics. Um, before they advance into humans, we can't possibly test all of the, the candidate treatments and, and vaccines that there have already been identified um, in humans. So we need to make sure that the best ones go forward into human trials. Um, we're doing a sequencing project to characterize the genetics of the virus, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, and we're working on, on better ways of testing, as I also mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So I just wanna talk a little bit about this sequencing project because I think it's the one that has the most direct impact here in Wisconsin. Um, so the SARS coronavirus 2, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, has in its RNA genome about 30,000 letters, about 30,000 nucleotides. So humans have about 3 billion DNA nucleotides in our genome, uh, making up all of our genes. So the virus has about 15 genes encoded by, um, by these 30,000 letters. And as the virus replicates, as it grows in each, each person, um, it makes mistakes, it makes mutations, and those mutations can, um, can be passed from one person to another when they pass on their infections. And so changes that accumulate um, in the viral genome over time are like signatures that we can use to trace how infections move through space and time. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how we're doing that here in Wisconsin. So um, the next couple of slides are, um, are the ones that, that are a bit more conceptual. So um, please ask questions about this after if uh, something doesn't make sense. Oh, I wanna also mention that um, the, the work that I'm about to present uh, is done primarily in the lab by two incredibly talented and dedicated graduate students. So Gage Moreno here on the top left uh, is a PhD student in the lab of David O'Connor, my friend and colleague who I'm working with on all of these projects. Um, Kat Braun is an MD PhD student in my own lab. So there they are hard at work in the lab. Um, the DNA sequencers that we're using for a lot of these projects um, are shown in the upper right. So there are actually five different DNA sequencer um, uh, cartridges in this machine. Each one of those cartridges is the size of a, a USB thumb drive. Um, but we can, uh, we can generate a huge amount of sequence data um, in one sort of instrument run, in one experiment um, by, by um, using all of these in parallel. And so what you see on the bottom right here is uh, Kat and Gage in the lab and the screen behind them is showing them that they're getting virus sequence data off this machine. And so their, their hard work is paying off for this particular experiment, it's working. Next slide, please. So um, what I show here in cartoon form is what we call a phylogenetic tree. Once we get to these sequences and we compare um, viruses to each other genetically, we can graphically represent how they're related in trees like this. So in this tree, um, each dot, uh, each red dot represents a viral sequence that we have characterized um, from a swab sample from a, a patient. Um, and the lines connecting those dots um, are longer, the, the more distantly related those uh, viruses are from each other. So viruses that have short lines connecting them are closely related genetically, maybe only one or two mutations different. Um, if you follow through all of the tree um, and connect one dot to each other through a long series of lines, that means they're distantly related to each other, both genetically and probably through time, because it takes time for many mutations to accumulate in the viral genome. So if you kind of look at this tree, what it's showing you is like the top two sequences um, are very closely related to each other. They um, have a predicted common ancestor, which is where the vertical line meets the horizontal line close to those two dots. Um, the computer says that, that they must have had a common ancestor 
um, pretty recently. And then they're closely related to two other sequences. Um, and then collectively, those top four sequences are distantly related um, to the two viruses sequenced at the bottom. So this is just sort of conceptually um, how we're going to organize the data that I'm about to show you. So let, let's look at a, a huge group of sequences in the next slide. Um, so another colleague of mine, Trevor Bedford, at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle has been collecting um, sequences from SARS coronavirus 2 samples, so, so from uh, swab samples collected from patients all over the world. Scientists all over the world are posting um, sequence information from viruses in their locations online in real time. And uh, what my friend Trevor is doing is collecting all of this and making a giant tree with thousands of sequences in it, like uh, the cartoon tree I just showed you. And here, the different viruses, um, each dot on this um, giant tree represents a, a virus that was sequenced from a, a patient sample in some lab somewhere in the world. And the sequences here are colored by the continent they come from. So um, viruses that were detected in Asia are in purple. Uh, viruses that were detected in North America are in the red colors. And I don't know if you can tell this, but um, sequences from Wisconsin uh, are shown in these in the larger dots. So most of those were um, were uploaded to the database and characterized in the lab here at UW by Gage and Cat. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so what we wanted to do was um, look at how viruses in Wisconsin are related to each other. So now we've um, sort of taken the the computer code that Trevor used to build that giant tree for the entire world and just, um, just applied it to viruses from Wisconsin. And um, what I'm coloring here is in the red colors, uh, viruses that were infecting people here in Dane County. Um, and in the gray colors, viruses that were detected in samples from patients in greater Milwaukee. And one thing that is interesting when, um, when scientists who look at these trees, um, look at this one, is that uh, you can see a bunch of gray viruses kind of in the middle, um, just under the, the, uh, the center, the horizontal center line, if you imagine a, a line going through the center. There's this collection of gray viruses where there's very, very few red ones. Um, and so this represents viruses that are being transmitted in Milwaukee, but we don't detect viruses genetically related to those in Dane County. And similarly, there are other groups of viruses on the tree where you see red sequences, but no gray ones. Um, and this suggests that there's not a whole lot of mixing between the Madison area and Milwaukee area outbreaks, that they are, are genetically, the viruses are genetically distinct from each other. So people are not transmitting those infections between these two locations, which is pretty interesting. Um, next slide, please. So when we look at data like this and try to draw conclusions from it, there's much more that I, uh, I could show you, but I won't bore you with all the details. Um, we're able to begin to see some patterns. So for example, um, in Dane County, we see evidence for many independent introductions. So many times somebody carried infection from somewhere else into Dane County. Primarily those viruses seem to have come from Europe. Um, we had an early case that was publicized that, um, that was in a traveler returning from Wuhan in China, but we find no evidence in our genetic profiling that that virus spread onward from that person. So in a sense, we kind of have lots of small independent fires here in Dane County. In the Milwaukee area, we see fewer, possibly earlier introductions of virus into the Milwaukee area. And the viruses that came into Milwaukee are closely related to viruses that were detected back in, in January and February in Asia. So maybe um, virus came to Milwaukee through Asia, maybe um, through some intermediate location, but we're seeing a lot of sustained community spread. So the cases that we're seeing in Milwaukee are not from newly imported cases, but primarily in this data, it looks like from cases acquired in the Milwaukee area. So in a sense, we have a fewer, a smaller number of larger, more established fires um, in the Milwaukee area. So the viruses from UW Health, um, you know, from Dane County and Milwaukee are genetically different. 
As I said, that means there's not much mixing between the two locations. And this suggests to us that um, there's been some success in um, the travel restrictions that uh, that we are still um, that we're still under. So if there was a lot of mixing between uh, Milwaukee and Madison, um, we would see the gray sequences and red sequences together throughout the tree, but we don't see that. Um, this is all preliminary, so we need to do more sequencing to help detect when there are new introductions, um, to help detect whether there are mixing of outbreaks. We could even potentially estimate the number of individual infections, how many infected people must have must be around to give rise to the, gen the genetic diversity that we see. And we hope that can help um, as we mature this process, uh, guide the allocation of public health resources. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying, you know, we're learning a lot about this virus, both here um, at UW-Madison and through our collaborations around the world. But, um, you know, as, as you may have heard uh, in media messages uh, surrounding everything about this pandemic, um, there's still so much to know. And unfortunately, I think we just need to embrace uncertainty. So um, big questions that we still have include, is everybody who's had uh, COVID-19, are they immune from reinfection and for how long? Um, if we relax social distancing now, will infections begin to increase again? Um, or is the virus going to somehow naturally go away? Um, if they decrease over the summer, will infections return in the fall? We've seen this pattern with pandemic influenza, for example. Um, once the virus sort of goes away from, uh, from our communities, we don't know whether it will come back again in the future. So these and many, many other questions remain unanswered. And that means that, that uh, we and, and many others still have a lot of work to do. So I'd like to end there and, um, and take whatever questions uh, you may throw me, Mike. Well, I think you just told me there's too much uncertainty for all the questions I wanted to ask. <laughs> there, um, there will just be error bars around the answers. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, you know, I found your data really interesting, and I think it's probably a good point. It might have been a good thing that we stopped uh, the Milwaukee Bucks games because I think there's a lot of mixing from Madison and Milwaukee people down there. Um, one question I was going to ask you about, I did read some reports again this weekend about promising news about vaccine development at Oxford University. It's just wondering what your thoughts are on the realistic time frame for a vaccine. And do you expect that we'll be able to come up with something that r is really highly effective in everyone who gets the vaccine? Or would it be more like the flu shot where, you know, it helps, but you can still get it? That's, that's a great question. And there are sort of many questions within that question. So let's see if yeah. I can if I can address them all. Um, so there was this story in the New York Times and in some other outlets uh, over the weekend talking about a, a very distinguished group of scientists um, at the Edward Jenner Institute, which is associated with Oxford University in England. Um, and they are beginning uh, uh, what they call a phase one, phase two trial of a vaccine candidate in humans uh, over in England. And so honestly, um, that is the first I had heard of that project. So um, despite all of the, the calls for, for open science, and this doesn't mean that, that, um, that no scientists had talked about that before, um, there's, there's also um, you know, one aspect of this pandemic for scientists, I think, is that there's just this fire hose of information every day. Um, so this was news to me over the weekend that, that um, these guys were developing this particular vaccine, although I'm not surprised because um, they had developed a, a very similar approach for other coronaviruses, for SARS and MERS. Um, and the, the um, animal data from those uh, previous vaccines that these guys developed are quite promising. Um, so I am optimistic that, uh, that their approach to making a vaccine will be, uh, will be successful, but, um, we're a ways from, from having a vaccine. You know, I, I think people need to understand, like there's many steps in going from a vaccine concept that may be built in a lab and may be tested in a small number of animals, say, um, to a, a vaccine that you can go to the doctor and receive. 
Um, there are many, many, many studies that need to be done from that early beginning to a, a vaccine that we can get. So, you know, optimistically, we are, are many months away, um, and even the most optimistic time frame from having a, an approved vaccine that, say, the FDA says is okay to give to people. Um, that seems a very promising candidate. There, there are a couple of others. Um, and as I think I mentioned, there's like 80 more in the queue that people want to test. Um, I personally think that um, that the challenge will not be um, making a vaccine that will be able to protect people. So you mentioned the flu shot. We have to get a new flu shot every year because the flu virus is constantly evolving and sort of evading our immune defenses. Um, at least for now, I don't think that's likely for the coronavirus because all of us, all 7 billion of us have never seen this virus before. Um, and so we are all naive. We don't have pre-existing immunity um, to the virus. And so I think that, um, that there's not going to be a lot of what we call selective pressure, not a, not a lot of natural selection for the virus to evade our immunity. Um, if the virus stays with us, and more of us become immune in time that may change. Um, but coronaviruses actually as a group evolve more slowly than viruses like influenza and HIV. So um, all of what we, scientists talk about this a lot, but um, it's a lot of speculation. So I don't think that protecting people with the vaccine against the virus that's around now um, will be super difficult but we cannot say what will happen in two or five or 10 years. Did that answer Great. all your questions? Yeah, yeah, and, and more. Um, say, uh, you showed your map of the COVID and where you have scholars working around the world and I couldn't help but notice, I don't think there were any dots in mainland China, which is really the epicenter. And obviously they're studying it very carefully. Um, are, are the Chinese scientists collaborating well with scientists in the West and you just don't have any in your group or how is that working? That's a, that's a great question. So here's the slide. Um, and you know, the, the COVID is a group that has really built um, organically through, um, you know, first people that, that we knew would be likely to, to be working on this. And then, you know, their, their friends and colleagues and their friends and colleagues, um, and so it did, we, we don't have existing research ties in our laboratories with people working um, in China. But I have to say that, um, that Chinese scientists as a group have been incredibly forthcoming um, and have done a tremendous amount of really good work, um, which they are communicating with the, the broader community through a, a number of different channels. Um, so they don't, we don't happen to have members in, in our group for a, a variety of reasons, but not because we made invitations that were rebuffed or because we were avoiding it, um, but just sort of through how the, the network has built. Um, but that, that does not mean at all that Chinese scientists have not done an outstanding job because they really have. Good. Well, that's good to know. Um, another question, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Dr. Peter Newcomer and Dean Bob Golden were on the show, and that was around the time we were doing the first work here locally with convalescent plasma as a potential treatment for patients. You mentioned we're not really finding many effective treatments. Um, is the convalescent plasma not really working out the way we'd hoped? or? say that. Um, the, the reason why this expert panel said that, that you know, so far there are no, no good treatments is not because there, there are none that are promising, but because um, there's just not a lot of rigorous data available on, on many treatments so far. Convalescent plasma is a great example. So it, convalescent plasma is, is being uh, tested here at UW and in many other uh, academic medical centers around the country but it's too early to tell for sure um, whether people receive more benefit from convalescent plasma than they do from, from just having um, supportive care and no treatment. Uh, there's, there's some very promising early data, but we don't have um, you know, like rigorous controlled 
uh, results yet to be able to to confidently say that it, that it's going to work. And there are problems with convalescent plasma that make us not want to use it long term. Great. Thank you. A uh, question from the audience from John, who saw the news on a pug being diagnosed with the coronavirus. Can this be transmitted between humans and or pets? Yeah, so uh, there was a piece on, on that just today, I think. Um, so you may also have seen that, um, that a tiger at the Bronx Zoo and actually now additional captive big cats have, have tested positive for coronavirus. Um, there have been other cases reported in other countries of domestic animals, uh, cats and dogs being, um, being infected. We know through laboratory studies that they are susceptible. But I think it's important to, to note that um, there's no evidence so far that, um, that domestic animals are an important source of infection in humans. So, so mostly what's happening, I would guess, is that these animals are getting infected from us. Um, and so, you know, if anything, uh, our pets may have a little bit more to worry about from us than, than we do from them. It's not impossible that pets could, could be a source of infection. So if someone um, someone infects a pet, that, that pet could be a source of infection for someone else in the, in the family or the household. But almost certainly the virus, if it enters someone's household, is going to be brought in a person um, rather than, than in a pet, I would say. Pets are natural social distancers. Uh, that depends. If you take your dog to the dog park, it doesn't seem that way. But, uh, but yes. <laughs> Question from Michael. For higher risk individuals, can you comment on the safety of going out, especially once the safer at home orders are relaxed? Yeah, this is this is really difficult, Michael. Um, so this is something that that scientists and, and public health people struggle with. Um, and how do we balance um, the the protections that people in society need with the the you know importance of of you know, opening the economy. And I think one of the most important things to, to say about all of this is that, um, especially before there is a vaccine, the response to a pandemic has to be a collective one. So it's not, um, it's not enough to ask individuals to look after their own individual interests. You know, what we're being asked to do in social distancing practices and in staying at home is to protect the most vulnerable among us. You know, I may not belong to a risk group. I might, but I might, I might not. If I feel like I, I don't have a lot to risk, then um, I could calculate that my risk is low, um, you know, and, and, and go out and mix with a lot of different people and say that, well, if I get it, it won't be so bad. But, you know, I don't know all the people that I may come in contact with uh, who might have uh, uh, you know, a condition that causes them to, to be more at risk. I'm sure all of us have people, if not in our households, you know, in our families, in our lives, who, um, who are at risk and who we care about. And so you know, what we're being asked to do is to look out for them and uh, for the healthcare professionals who are on the front lines, right? Um, so you know, wh what do you do to, to, uh, to be safe um, is you know, look for um, for information from reputable sources, um, you know, try to understand what your risk is. Talk to your doctor if you can do that. Um, take the steps that have been outlined. So, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, um, stay six feet away from other people. Don't don't make unnecessary trips. Um, all of those things that we've heard are are the tools that we have now to prevent transmission, and, and they're still going to be necessary, even if um, the the you know mandatory stay-at-home order is lifted. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation that it'll, it'll be hard to get everyone to just rush out once it's lifted. I think people will still be cautious. Do you think over time as we reopen, there might be a maybe a change in philosophy where people at higher risk are encouraged to take more precaution and others can begin to resume normal activity? Would that be a way to approach easing? Sure, and that, that's certainly part of the, the approaches, you know, many of the approaches that have been um, laid out in, in the plans that you may have seen. Um, you know, so I, I think there is validity to that, and I think that, that, you know, we need to strike a balance, as I said, but we also need to recognize that, um, that 
even though my individual risk may be low, I may interact with people whose individual risk is higher. So um, we, we have to maintain this vigilance. And we also have to, to remember that, you know, as I said, we, we have to embrace uncertainty. So this is a virus that, that is brand new to, to science. So we don't know that much about it. Um, if cases begin to wane, we don't know if that means they will eventually go down to zero, um, you know, or if they will go to zero or go to some low level for some time and then come back. Um, and so we also need to be open to the possibility that although we may ease restrictions, um, we may have to reimpose them at some point. So, you know, we're not out of this yet until um, really until there's a vaccine or until, um, you know, we demonstrate that there is just no no further transmission in the world. Great. Um, question from the audience. If one tests positive for COVID-19 but is asymptomatic, do you still develop antibodies and will those antibodies be as prevalent as they would in someone who really suffered with the disease and recovered? That is an excellent question. And I'm afraid one that we don't have a clear answer to. Um, so if you test positive and don't have symptoms, that, that could happen to a lot of people. So that would mean probably that you um, tested positive for the presence of the virus itself. So most of the initial testing we talked about looked for the virus itself. We're also now hearing about tests that detect antibodies against the virus. And so they can detect um, whether you have been exposed to the virus in the past um, and developed an immune response to it. Uh, whether you are symptomatic or not, you might still have antibodies. It is possible that um, somebody who is asymptomatic didn't have as much virus in their system as somebody who uh, developed severe symptoms. And if that were the case, then you could imagine that some people might test positive for virus at some point, um, but not make a very strong antibody response. I should say that um, in the few studies that have really looked at this carefully, so far there has been no relationship uh, discernible between the amount of virus present in someone's respiratory secretion. So they do like a nasal swab or they look in sputum that you might hawk up into a tube. Um, and so there's, there's been no correlation between the amount of virus that is detectable um, in a person and the severity of their symptoms. So it's hard to predict what the relationship between testing positive um, and future immunity might be. But it's possible that some people will have strong immunity and some people will not have particularly strong immunity. We just don't know that yet. Great. Um, I guess a number of people wonder about the following question. If there are multiple strains of the coronavirus, uh, how could one vaccine solve the problem for these multiple strains? Also a good question. So if you've been following any of the stories about um, the sort of analysis of viral evolution, like I presented here, um, you know, people will talk about the, the virus, um, you know, sort of accumulating these mutations as, as the virus um, spreads from one person to another, as it grows in one person, um, mutations will happen. They totally do. Um, but it's important to remember that for when scientists talk about mutations, we just mean a change. We just mean a change in the genetic code. So while um, viruses are, are changing, this, this genetic code is changing, the, the changes are often um, very, very small. So like one of, in 30,000 um, nucleotide letters can distinguish one virus from another. But as far as we can tell right now, all of the changes that we've seen, um, there's no evidence that they have any biological impact. So um, we're very careful about not saying strains right now. So there are different kind of genetic flavors of the virus, but um, they sort of all operate, as far as we can tell right now, as one strain. So I would expect that a vaccine that protected you against one sequence would protect you against all the sequences that we know about so far. In the future, if the virus stays with us for many years, then it may begin to adapt to human immunity. And then we may need to update our vaccines someday in the future. But this is that is speculation. We don't know how it's going to unfold. Thank you. Uh, question from Darwin. Uh, since this can be transmitted through air, is six feet still a safe distance, in your opinion? And would that depend on the type of area you're in if it had forced airflow like an airplane or an office building, are we at greater risk? Or even outside, I'm downwind from somebody, maybe six feet should be 12 feet. 
Sure, um, that's a good question. So, um, so a lot of times when scientists talk about respiratory viruses like this, we we use the term airborne transmission. Um, and so, on the technical side, we we are when we do that, we are trying to sort of consciously combine um, two slightly different things. One is aerosol, and the other is respiratory droplets. Um, so this is gross, but when I'm talking right now at my computer screen, um, I am like spitting invisible little particles um, of, of spit at my computer screen. They're kind of landing on my laptop. Um, and if someone else came along, so my, my wife or kid came in here and, and started typing on my laptop and then rubbed their eyes, then, then they might get that respiratory droplet on them. Um, those respiratory droplets that, um, that leave my mouth when I'm talking and even when I'm just breathing, um, they, they travel ballistically. So that means that they act like little um, projectiles and they don't fly much farther than six feet, which is why um, the six foot recommendation is there. So um, it seems epidemiologically that most of the transmission that, that we can tell is by respiratory droplet and not through aerosol. Um, and so the six foot distance should be good to protect you from that. Um, but I think we're going to have to do a little bit of further work to understand whether like in some circumstances, aerosols, like which are tiny particles that can remain suspended in the air for a long time, um, whether they play a role in transmission. Um, there have been some studies. There was just a really interesting one from South Korea that came out over the weekend uh, that looked at transmission within an office building, but it was in a call center where people um, sat at desks facing each other. And, and people, they even mapped out like who got infected where in the call center. And it was mostly people who sat directly across from one another and therefore were likely in the path of respiratory droplets as they talked on the phone. Um, so I, I think droplets are, are probably the most important um, uh, uh, means of transmission that we know about right now. And, and that six feet is good. I hope that helps. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Very practical question. Um, you know, so when we think about social distancing and keeping people from getting infected and slowing the spread, obviously that gives more time to do research and understand the virus and maybe a better chance at getting a vaccine before too many people get the virus. It also reduces the peak load burden on the health system, which is also really important, I think, uh, to helping the most people we can. But when we get to the other side of the pandemic, looking back, how, what percentage of Americans do you think will have been exposed to the virus? Will it be 80%, 40%, 20%? What's your guess on that? Boy, Am I going to get the virus, Tom? Um, well, I think absence of vaccine, um, in, in, like eventually most of us probably will. Um, so if there were no vaccine, um, you know, if this was 1918 and we didn't know how to make vaccines, um, then, then ultimately most of us would probably be exposed. Maybe half, um, you know, people have maybe more, um, people have like, they're people way smarter than I am with, with the relevant expertise have, have sort of come up with, um, with models that have tried to predict, well, if there were no vaccine, how many people would get infected and how long would that take? Um, and so that people have estimated anywhere between 40 and 80% of, of, of the, the human population might ultimately be exposed. Um, so I think this is a very contagious virus. I think that, that without um, control measures like, like a vaccine, um, then yeah, ultimately a lot of us will be exposed. The question is um, how long will that take? And if we continue with social distancing measures um, and we start, what we're doing is buying time to develop a vaccine so that not everyone is exposed. And as you say, we don't, um, we don't get all of those infections all at once and just overburden the entire healthcare system and have it collapse. And one thing I think people should keep in mind with that is that um, you know, people do not stop um, having strokes and heart attacks and car accidents um, when there's a pandemic. And so if the healthcare system is overwhelmed by COVID patients, that also means that other people um, are going to suffer because they, they won't be able to access care that they otherwise would have. Um, so th there's sort of knock-on effects too. So it's important to, to maintain our, our vigilance. So even as we begin to ease, um, we have to watch carefully to see if cases come back, 
um, if there's evidence that they're homegrown, meaning that these fires have kind of smoldered and we're letting them get more oxygen or if they're being reintroduced from someplace else. Um, but we're going to have to watch carefully and we're going to have to be driven by by data and, and how we respond in the future to, to keep that number as low as possible. Question from Hansa, how much does viral loading impact the probability of the severity of the virus? So or I the, guess severity yeah, the, maybe. The viral load um, is a term that we use um, to, to say how much virus is present in um, like in respiratory secretion. So when we test for the virus, what happens is um, basically someone shoves a Q-tip up your nose they have a test tube, they put it in the test tube and the test tube has a little bit of liquid in it. They swish the test tube around in the liquid that gets some of the snot and cells and virus um, off of the, the Q-tip. And then we can sort of like suck that up with a pipette and measure it. Um, we actually detect the, the viral nucleic acid, not the, not the virus itself in these tests. Um, and so the viral load refers to the amount of virus that we detect in that, that swab liquid. Um, so as I was just saying, the the there is so far no correlation. Like you might expect that, um, you know, if uh, if I tested positive and you told me like you could either have a lot of virus or a little virus, um, which would you rather have? Like obviously, I would rather have a little. <laughs> um, but but so far in the data that we've seen, um, there's been no correlation between the amount of virus that's present, so the viral load somebody has. Um, and the severity of their disease. People seem to have about the same kind of viral load trajectory with time, whether they go on to develop disease or not. Uh, Tom, another question about recent outbreaks in Green Bay. Uh, there seem to be ties to workplaces which are kept cold, like food processing plants in particular. Um, what rules of thumb do researchers have in mind for temperatures that preserve viruses. Is there something related to the nature of those workplaces or is it just proximity of employees that's driving that? that that's a good question. Um, so there, there's been work done, um, there's a really nice study by a, a scientist called Denise Lowen um, and she's at Emory University. So she looked at the effect of temperature and humidity on um, on transmission of influenza. This was a few years ago, so nobody knew what, what COVID was. Um, and she found that for influenza anyway, um, humidity played a really important role, temperature less so. Um, and, and so uh, lower humidity actually seems to facilitate transmission of, of virus between animals in that experiment. Um, and so we've interpreted that to mean that, that, I mean, there's any number of reasons why that, that might be. We don't know totally what the mechanism is. Um, so humidity could be important. Um, cold, uh, potentially, I, I suppose, could be important. Um, but I, I suspect that, um, that what is driving uh, transmission in those places is that you have a lot of people working very closely together for a long period of time uh, during the day. And so this, this study I mentioned um, of, a, of a call center in South Korea, um, one of the um, one of the interpretations they had was that um, there's actually relatively little transmission um, in the household contacts of the people who worked in this call center, a lot more in the call center itself. Um, and so they said maybe like prolonged contact played an important role in transmission there. Hmm. A question from Nancy. She notes that Ebola has reemerged in the Congo and that COVID-19 is also entering Africa um, this is a rather scary question. Do we know what might happen in a human host infected with both? And I would add, can two positives, no, I'm, no, I probably can't. Can two negatives make a positive? I doubt it. Would there be a new virus that would be created from the fusion of those two or would it just be a, uh, a very deadly situation? Uh, that, that's a good question. So, um, so Ebola virus is from a completely different family of viruses. Uh, it's, it's very, 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 very distantly related to, to coronaviruses. And so while it would be very unfortunate indeed um, for a person to be infected with both viruses, I, I can't think of a, a biological reason why that would not be possible. If you were exposed to both viruses around the same time, I, I suspect you could be infected with both. Um, 
but there is no mechanism that I know of by which they could, um, you know, somehow recombine to, to create uh, some, some kind of uh, Ebola coronavirus hybrid. They're, they're way too distantly related for that. We wouldn't become a superhero. No, uh, may, no. Uh, I think you'd have to like be exposed to your radiation at the same time. Yeah. So um, last question. You know, we hear reports periodically about um, the possibility that maybe some lab in China near the Wuhan market uh, might have developed the virus and it leaked out from there. And there's talk about trying to figure out, you know, what was really the origin of it. How would people go about that? And do you place any stock in the possibility that this virus really originated in a lab? either in China or, or who knows where? Is that possible? Um, I mean, I, I don't and think- Could we it, know? Um, we, we can know. Um, I, I, I don't think it is, po it, it's not impossible. So, um, you know, labs work on coronaviruses. There, there does happen to be a biosafety level four um, high containment virology laboratory in, in Wuhan. Um, and my understanding is that the, the scientists who work there uh, receive their training from American scientists and how to, to um, you know, work safely uh, with pathogens. You know, we're particularly interested in, um, in maintaining surveillance throughout the world for, um, for viruses that, that may emerge and cause another pandemic. And so I guess to, to answer that question, um, I will first emphatically say that, that, um, that, I, I don't think that this is a, a lab um, escapee. I don't think there's there's solid evidence for that. I think that um, I will circle back to what I was talking about, um, you know, my lab's interest uh, at the beginning of, of the evening is, you know, we know that um, animal viruses infect humans all the time. Um, that through all sorts of, of activities, you know, hunting, agriculture, um, uh, you know, food preparation, um, humans all over the world are exposed to animal viruses all the time. And if you look, you find that people are getting infected. So the, the rate limiting step, like the thing that determines what is going to become a new pandemic, um, is not the, like an animal virus getting into one human somewhere. Um, but rather, the that virus happening to infect a person who happens to be susceptible that virus happening to to somehow stumble upon solutions to um evolutionary puzzles and then getting out of that person and and um transmitting to to more people now we're particularly concerned recently about um about this type of scenario uh in china because we have seen in the recent past um signals of potentially pandemic viruses emerging through natural processes from China. The first SARS virus is a coronavirus closely related to this one um, that, that emerged in southern China and um, began to spread around the world, but was stamped out um, in 2003 before it, it got out of control. Um, we've been worried about avian influenza viruses like the H7N9 virus, um, which seasonally caused human spillover infections um, in China and, and elsewhere. And so, um, you know, it, it seemed those had some worrisome evolutionary signals also, although they didn't end up causing a, a pandemic, at least not yet. Um, but there is every reason to, um, to place uh, laboratories around the world um, in places where viruses may naturally emerge so that we can keep an eye on the situation. And that's exactly what um, the Chinese lab was working on. So that there's a huge number of bat coronaviruses that naturally infect Eurasian bats. Um, and we've had a few now um, you know, escape bats and begin infecting humans. So that was the, the, these were natural processes and um, by far the simplest explanation for the emergence of this virus um, you know, everything we see about it is entirely consistent with, uh, you know, what was ultimately a bat virus beginning to infect people through what unfortunately is a recurring natural process. Great. 
Well, Tom, uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy days to uh, spend some time with us and be our in-house expert. Um, you've always been gracious about doing that. And uh, I really want to thank you again for joining us in this new format. It's the largest event you and I have ever done together. So how about that? Wow, okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank our audience for joining us again this week. Uh, we'll be back, of course, next week on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. It happens to be Giving Tuesday on May 5th. And uh, I'll be joined by two guests. Derek Kindle is the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management and Acting Director of Student Financial Aid. And uh, as you can imagine, Derek and his colleagues are working very hard to try to bring in a new class of Badgers uh, with a lot going on in the background. And we'll also hear from Barb Penekenstein, who is the Richard Seneco Professor in Healthcare Leadership. And she is, of course, uh, gonna be able to speak from her perspective as a nursing professor uh, about all the work that nurses are facing uh, in fighting this on the front lines. So we'll look forward to that. Thanks for joining us and on Wisconsin.